vouchers are not so popular in many parts of rural America. So <laughs> should we come, should we come back to Texas? So, so what is going on in Texas? Welcome to Respecting Religion, a BJC podcast series where we look at religion, the law, and what's at stake for faith freedom today. I'm Amanda Tyler, Executive Director of BJC. And I'm General Counsel Holly Holman. Today is part two of our discussion on school vouchers, a topic we wanted to discuss because we're seeing new voucher proposals pursued quite vigorously, particularly in Texas, but in other places as well, and because the topic plays into larger legal and policy debates about public schools and the relationship between religion and government. That's right, Holly. Last week we covered a lot, and if you have not listened to Episode 8 of this season, you'll want to check it out to get ready for our conversation today. We talked about why BJC is opposed to school vouchers, which tend to use public funds for private and religious education. We believe that public funds are for public education and that vouchers harm public schools, entangling the government with religion. We affirm the right of parents to choose a religious education for their children, but we don't think taxpayers should pay for it. It's not the role of the government to develop students in matters of faith and religious practice. But it is, however, a primary function of the state to provide education for all its citizens. We also talk some about how vouchers can take many forms. Basically, a school voucher means that the government sends taxpayer dollars to pay for tuition at a private school. And that school does not have the same rules or oversight as a government-run or public school. Private schools don't have to take all students, and they are often religious in nature, which means that taxpayer dollars are, in essence, funding religious instruction. We noted that there are a variety of ways that such programs aimed at funding religious schools can be designed. These can be called scholarships or tuition tax credits or other names like that. But often these voucher schemes all result in the same situation. The government is indirectly funding religious education with taxpayer money. The Supreme Court heard a voucher case in 2002 Zellman versus Simmons Harris and upheld the program from Cleveland, Ohio. Last week, we looked at the holding in that case, which upheld a specific voucher program and gave guidance to lower courts about what it takes for a voucher program to pass constitutional muster. And so we want to pick up on the conversation this week with a look at the impact of that case, and we'll get into what's happening in Texas, too. The Zellman decision did not indicate that every voucher program is constitutional, and it also doesn't mean that every voucher program will be required or recommended for a given community. That is certainly the case, as well as there were additional legal arguments still to be made in the voucher context, um, particularly whether uh, voucher programs could fit in other contexts other than public education, you know, how, how this ruling uh, might apply more broadly in other government programs, and we saw some litigation about that. And then, of course, there, are, there were other legal barriers to voucher programs, including specific language in state constitutions that made it more difficult to send government money to private religious um, institutions. Of course, while uh, these conversations about vouchers continued in some states, particularly with regard to specific state constitutions, uh, there have been a series of cases in various c- contexts making their way through the courts that led to a trilogy of decisions by this Supreme Court that has made those state constitutions much less effective as any barrier to government money funding uh, religious institutions, uh, including churches as well as religious schools. And here we're talking about the trilogy of cases, Trinity Lutheran, the so-called playground case, 
then Espinoza, which was in 2020, which dealt with um, education savings accounts, and then Carson v. Macon, which I like to think of as the accidental voucher program. That's the 2022 program out of Maine. And you can find out more information about those cases um, on BJC website, as well as in past Respecting Religion episodes. All of this to say is that the legal barriers, the constitutional barriers for vouchers have continued to be narrowed and basically chipped away at. So as you note, Holly, particularly with this recent trilogy of cases, there are fewer constitutional barriers to voucher programs. Uh, But that doesn't mean that we've seen a widespread proliferation of voucher programs because there are still many public policy reasons why uh, legislatures are not quick to adopt them. And we'll get into those uh, current debates, policy debates, and political fights after the break. So it's been 20 years since Zellman, uh, 21 years, uh, but we have recently seen some increased interest in passing some of these voucher schemes. And so we're going to link in show notes to a helpful roundup piece from Politico by Andrew Atterbury, and it's titled, GOP States Are Embracing Vouchers, Wealthy Parents Are Benefiting. And his piece walks through recent efforts in states like Florida, Iowa, Arkansas, and Texas. The first question he helps us answer is, who wants vouchers and why? Well, first, we have so-called school choice advocates um, who are arguing that competition helps the public schools and that public schools are failing. And we have more and more people who are coming to this camp after COVID, which sent many people to homeschooling or private schools. We've also seen increased culture wars that are playing out at school board meetings about parental choice when it comes to education. And so uh, this quote unquote school choice community is growing. But the unfortunate thing is pointed out in this article is that Uh, This often pits communities against each other by arguing that the wealthy people already have school choice because they have the money to send their kids wherever they want to go, and that these programs are just trying to give the same benefit to families that could not afford to send their children to private schools. And, you know, I think that that is an argument that we have to take seriously and and think about what, what is the response. Is that accurate? What is the response to that? You know, and I think that while some of these programs are sometimes pursued in hopes that competition among schools will lead to increased student achievement and decreased education costs, the data that supports those outcomes is scarce. We, we aren't seeing that this kind of competition necessarily improves student achievement or decreases education costs. I think that is a very helpful article to show these different arguments. I also, just from experience, having heard these arguments for so many years, um, always question to what extent that is the case, that the um, advocacy, the school voucher advocacy groups are growing versus um, they are finding new arguments to fan the flames against public schools in order to try to um, get people more interested in vouchers. Um, But yes, let's keep talking about that article, which talks about the different ways that they're successful and unsuccessful, right? Yeah. And I mean, I think it's a really helpful corrective to to make that point, Holly. And the language of school choice is not new. Um, it was used after Brown versus Board of Education to subsidize parents who wanted to remove their children from the desegregating schools. And the language was also repeated by libertarians like Milton Friedman, whose real end goal was privatizing education altogether. Um, And we're going to link in show notes to an opinion piece by Nancy McLean, who is history and public policy professor at Duke, uh, that ran a couple of years ago in the Washington Post under the title, School Choice Developed as a Way to Protect Segregation and Abolish Public Schools. Uh, I just think that's an important frame from history to remember that some of these items recirculate in in modern times. And also, you know, this argument, well, we're really just trying 
to help kids and families who could not afford on their own to go to private schools is not being reflected in some of the current policy decisions that are being made. The Politico article points out that many of these new measures are passed without any income restrictions so that the vouchers are going to wealthy families who were already sending their children to private schools. They find, for instance, um, that in some of these states that have passed programs, a lot of them are applying for education savings accounts for their kindergartners. So they're not removing them from schools. They're making a choice from the beginning to go to private schools uh, with the money uh, that the government's giving them. And in that way, I think the argument that the dollars are just following the child, as vouchers are supposed to do in some of these programs, is doesn't ring as true. Um, the vouchers are just used to siphon money off from public schools in favor of private schools. The article also points out that in addition to the school choice uh, community of, of parents, we also have interest groups involved, including one very powerful interest group called the American Federation for Children. Uh, Betsy DeVos, former Secretary of Education, has been involved in this organization for years, and the organization has a PAC, or Political Action Committee, that puts money into elections to try to elect uh, candidates for office who will support voucher programs. And I think that school choice language can be really insidious. Obviously, as Americans, and we, we value our freedom and the idea of choice in the market is something that's, that can be very appealing across the board. Um, and so it's not surprising that advocates for vouchers and uh, getting government funding for private education would use that language. But it's, uh, it's really a distraction from, I think, what most families really want for their children, and that is quality schools. And so if you have quality public schools that serve everyone without regard to religion, Religion, and if we could do a better job uh, supporting public schools and making sure that they serve everyone without uh, so much regard to income levels as well, then uh, we wouldn't have this conversation about choice and needing to have a bunch of different choices. You know, you just need to have a good public school everywhere. You need to have good public schools everywhere that can serve and educate all children. Absolutely. And that's a huge public policy concern and challenge right now. And uh, these voucher programs kind of abandon that larger conversation about the public schools in favor of funding private schools and other options. So we've talked about who's supportive of the voucher programs. Now we want to talk about who's opposing the voucher programs. Well, some are well-known and ones that you might guess, like public education groups, including teacher unions and others who work day in, day out in the public schools uh, and are concerned about efforts that look like they are abandoning public schools for other places. And blaming them and blaming them for all the problems in our, uh, in our political environment. Absolutely. I mean, just like a very brief aside, but as parents of public school kids, Holly, I think we can both say, you know, just how underappreciated our public school yes. teachers, administrators, and other staff are, and how they often get caught and used in these public policy debates. Absolutely. But more surprising to many are that many rural communities are opposing vouchers, because public schools are such an important part of their community and their local economy, and there just aren't that many private schools in many of these areas. There's not the choice that people um, talk about in a lot of these other communities. And, you know, one piece that we're going to link in show notes is a commentary for Brookings written by Devin Carlson, who's an associate professor of political science at the University of Oklahoma. And uh, we'll link in show notes, but I'll just do one quick quote from his paper. He writes, quote, the urban rural divide among GOP legislators on this issue almost certainly contributes to the lack of statewide school choice programs in other red states, including Wyoming, Iowa, 
asterisk. He wrote this before Iowa passed one. Uh, Nebraska, Kansas, Alabama, Montana, Utah, the Dakotas, and perhaps most notably Texas. On the surface, the partisan and ideological composition of these states' legislatures would seem to predispose them to school vouchers and educational choice programs more generally. However, the realities of rural schooling cut across these partisan and ideological considerations and introduce a second major dimension to the politics of school vouchers in red states. I think that's what I was thinking of, Amanda, just that uh, while having choices in general sounds good, uh, at the end of the day, what people want is to have a good place to send their kids to school. And it's unrealistic, and it, it really makes no sense to talk about school choice in many, many parts of our country um, where there's only going to be one uh, public school uh, serving a community. And there's a great opportunity for that school to bring people together, to provide quality education, and as that article shows, um, do so much more in a community sort of kind of becomes a a central place of people knowing each other, working together, being neighbors. So (laughs) should we, should we come back to Texas? So so what (laughs) is going on in Texas? So given all of, given that piece, that's that study and what we understand is why vouchers are not so popular in many parts of rural America, what is happening in Texas? Well, in addition to the Texas Longhorns going to the college football playoff for the first time ever. <laughs> I asked for that, yeah. Um, yes, hook them horns. Um, in addition to that, but, you know, actually, Holly, not that unrelated because everything in Texas comes down to football. We have seen Governor Greg Abbott have this really concerted push to try to push a voucher program across the line here in Texas. Um, he wants to join some of those states like Iowa, Arkansas, and Florida, And in the Texas version, it would be in the form of education savings accounts. It's been an 18-month campaign by the governor, and it still has not come to fruition for him. His latest version would provide $10,500 for private education and up to $1,000 for homeschooling in these education savings accounts. And we first talked about Governor Abbott's push back in episode one of this season, Because incredibly, Holly, like I still can't really believe this, (laughs) Governor Abbott began his uh, campaign this fall with a quote unquote school choice Sunday in which he instructed pastors to preach in favor of his policy. And we talked then and we still believe that this move was an egregious example of state overreach into the matters of religion. Totally. And I'm sure... It was not appreciated in many of these rural school districts where the the churches are filled with people who work in the public schools. Yeah. So here we are, two months later, and despite of or maybe because of the governor's strong arm tactics, we still don't have school vouchers in Texas. And the fact that he's not yet been successful in this effort might be surprising to many people, given that Texas is still a Republican-controlled state, as evidenced by the passage of many conservative and sometimes very conservative policies this past legislative session, some of which we've talked about here on Respecting Religion. But the politics that we just noted, particularly the rural opposition to vouchers, has dealt Governor Abbott a series of defeats and most Recently, in a fourth special session called by the governor, the Republican-controlled Texas House of Representatives voted 84 to 63, so not close, against the voucher proposal, stripping it from a larger public education funding bill. And this was really stunning for many people. This is the first time that the House had actually voted directly on vouchers in a long time, so we weren't really sure how it was going to come out. Um, But it failed, even despite of the amount of effort and political pressure both the governor and the lieutenant governor, Dan Patrick, who also heads the Texas Senate, has put on these House Republicans, not to mention all of the PACs and other moneyed interests that are focused on these uh, remaining holdouts, these Republican holdouts. Because if Republicans voted in a block on this issue, they could pass it tomorrow. Wow. Wow. I can see why you say it's stunning, um, Amanda, particularly from when you compare it to some of the other things that uh, the Republican majority has pushed through in Texas and and the power that they have. On the other hand, it is um, not surprising, given all the arguments that we've been talking about and the complexity of 
the importance of public education and how this particular policy not only uh, is not proven to help public education, but can have a lot of other harmful results on a community um, and what brings a community together, you know, doesn't really do what its proponents say it will do. And so I'm um, happy about that result and happy for a vigorous debate in Texas when it comes to public schools and religion and this idea of funding education through vouchers. Yeah, I, I think it's encouraging that we are having a robust public policy debate conversation, not just in the legislature, but I can say, Holly, living here now in the public conversation. I mean, I am not used to seeing articles about vouchers on the front page of the paper. Yes, I still get a hard copy paper of my local paper, the Dallas Morning News, which um, just last week had a front page story saying uh, the title on my paper was Are Vouchers Inevitable?, question mark. Um, And then the it was a long article with uh, pro and anti voucher interest groups talking about the politics of the issue. Um, I'd also point out as another really helpful piece to help understand what's going on. Reporting in general from the Texas Tribune, which does really outstanding reporting around Texas politics. But um, they have a great piece that focuses on one of these holdouts, these House Republicans, Representative Gary Van Dever, who represents a district in northeast Texas, very rural district. We'll uh, put in the show notes a link to the piece titled, Our Public School System is Our Town, Why This Rural Republican is Voting Against School Vouchers. And reporters Brian Lopez and Patrick Svedek uh, note how the upcoming Republican primary might come into play um, for members like uh, Representative Van Dever because it seems like Republican primary voters are very pro-voucher. Um, they There was a ballot initiative or just not even an initiative, kind of a – just a – what do you think about this issue on the last primary ballot for the Republicans? And in this particular district, 87 percent of them approved of uh, vouchers. And so we're seeing like a big disconnect between what people say they want, but then when it actually comes to what happens in their community, what's really going to serve their community. And I think that's the debate that's playing out. And I joked about football earlier, but really in a lot of these small towns, the local high school, the the Friday night lights is a very real thing. You know, it's a community gathering place for the community. It is also a place where a lot of people are employed in these small towns. Um, So public schools are, are very important, particularly in rural communities. And I think we're seeing why this policy just doesn't make sense for a lot of places and how that's playing out at the Texas legislature. And I like the the diversity of opinion that we're starting to hear within that Republican caucus, I guess, in in Texas. Um, But what I really like is for people to pay attention to the diversity of thought within religious circles in Texas as well, and not to assume that pastors necessarily are all about funding private religious education. And in fact, we know, Amanda, the group Pastors for Texas Children that brings together pastors and other people working in churches and those that uh, go to churches and support churches coming together to support Texas children by opposing school vouchers. And they know the way communities work in their different religious communities, different uh, religious beliefs, but all caring about their community and their children and wanting strong public schools and being very wary of programs that would harm public schools and instead divert money to private religious education. Yeah, we're we're so grateful for the advocacy of Pastors for Texas Children and the larger coalition of groups that's working together um, to help have a really reasoned policy debate that will come to the right result for everyone, not just the few interests that are pushing for this bill. As we close out today's show, I just want to remind all of you that this debate over school vouchers is continuing across our country. We have resources in our show notes that we mentioned in the last segment, and we'll add some other resources too. 
These resources will show why BJC continues to be concerned about the impact of voucher programs and how they affect faith freedom for all. As we've discussed here and in earlier podcasts, the current Supreme Court has moved away from a clear articulation of religion's special place in our constitutional tradition and the separation model that has long served as a barrier to government entanglement in religion. How the high court's decisions play out in the lower courts is a matter that we and others are closely watching and seeking to influence. At the same time, so much depends on what elected officials in states and communities do to provide for quality education and how they understand or fail to understand the impact of so many attacks on public education, as well as the attacks on religious freedom. And these debates, both here in Texas and elsewhere, don't happen in an ivory tower. They are playing out in state legislatures and community gatherings across our country, I hope that if you are listening to the podcast, that you are also involved in your local community to support public schools, ensuring that all children have access to a quality education, no matter their faith. That brings us to the close of this episode of Respecting Religion. Thanks for joining us. For more information on what we discussed, visit our website at respectingreligion.org for show notes and a transcript of this program, as well as a link to part one of the discussion. This episode of Respecting Religion is produced and edited by Cheryl and Guy with editorial assistance from Scotty Bryan, Guthrie Graves, Fitzsimmons, and Jennifer Hawks. Learn more about our work at BJC Defending Faith Freedom for All by visiting our website at bjconline.org. We would love to hear from you. You can send both of us an email by writing to respectingreligion at bjconline.org. We're also on social media at BJC on the Hill, and you can follow me on X, which used to be called Twitter, at Amanda Tyler BJC. And if you enjoyed this show, share it. Take a moment to leave us a review or a five-star rating to help others find us. We also want to thank you for supporting this podcast. You can donate to these conversations by visiting the link in our show notes. Join us on Thursdays for new conversations respecting religion.